Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Aaron Salzberg. Aaron is director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina. From 2010 to 2017, he serves as the special coordinator for water resources for the U.S. Department of State. Aaron is also a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. He joins us today to discuss the Grand Ethiopian, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Aaron, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, happy to be here. So th this dam project, nearly a decade in the making, Africa's largest hydroelectric dam, twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty is one estimate I heard. Uh, it, before we delve into the current politics and the situation, could you just give us the brief history lesson on the origins of the project and what its goal is? It's a, it's a good question. So the, um, the project was initiated in 2011. Uh, this is a project fully funded by the Ethiopian government. Uh, and its primary purpose is to provide power and revenue for, for the Ethiopian people. And so uh, this is a country where right now about 50% of the population lack access to regular energy services. Uh, so the dam is intended to double energy production within Ethiopia and to help expand uh, service to the Ethiopian people. A, a mantra of water discussions is we all live downstream. And that's where the, the problems begin to arise. Egypt, 90% of its water comes from the Nile River. And that's where the disruption could occur. Could you explain what the, the, the problems are, what Egypt's objections are? Well, it's not just Egypt, it's Sudan as well. Sudan is, Sudan is in the middle, caught in the middle, right, geographically. Yeah, and, 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 and dams, dams are, um, they're a double-edged sword. They're critically important pieces of infrastructure for managing water resources, for storing water, for making sure you've got water for agricultural purposes, for generating clean energy. But at the same time, they can have profound uh, downstream impacts on the environment and on livelihoods. Uh, yeah, th there are a couple elements to this. One is, will it impact the absolute quantity of water that's going downstream? And two, will it impact the quality of the water that goes downstream? You know, from a quantity perspective, uh, once you pass the prime filling stage of the dam, uh, ideally, whatever flows into the dam flows out of the dam as well to produce power so that the overall flows will remain, uh, remain the same. Uh, quality is a different issue. And of course, um, depending on how you manage the dam, operate the dam, release water from the dam, it could impact uh, the conditions of the water downstream, which could impact fisheries and things like that. Now, the regulation of flows out of the dam, in other words, this was a very seasonal river. Now that we'll be flattening that hydrograph will enable some increased development of that water to happen downstream. So Sudan, for example, might be able to increase its agricultural production, and that could begin to take some water out of the system, which could then have an impact on Egypt. The fact that you don't have that flood pulse coming down anymore could also impact recession agriculture in Sudan, which might then uh, uh, impact some of the farmers who depend on those lands right alongside the river to be replenished by silt every time the wet season comes and those lands get flooded and they start to plant in, in those areas. So there could be a number of different impacts um, on, on farming downstream, as well as overall amounts of water. The real challenge- oh, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. No, no, I, I, what I was gonna ask is about trying to quantify this. And it, is there a precedent elsewhere on the globe? I mean, the, the sheer scale of this project is hard to wrap your head around. I, I mentioned that statistic I found about twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty. I saw another that it will take seven years to fill the reservoir. So just the sheer size of this, is, is there any other comparable on the planet that gives us some indication of where these potential impacts that you were just describing, how they might on, uh, on, on how they might uh, happen. Yeah, there, there are other large dams across the planet. Uh, China has a couple. Uh, there are a couple spread out through in other places throughout the world. Uh, and you can do dams well. Um, there, there are uh, pretty well understood procedures for building and operate dams that can mitigate some of those downstream impacts. The key is to really look at the science, look at the hydrology, and make sure that you're building and operating the structure in the best way possible to get what you can out of the water that, so you don't create some of those downstream harms. But you can do this right. Why, why is it taking so long to reach agreement? The US attempted to play mediator about a year ago or more, had some of the, the, the involved uh, uh, negotiators come to DC. Uh, and yet here we are and the dam is beginning to fill and we still don't have agreement. Yeah, I mean, even under the best of circumstances, I think these are very, very hard problems to solve. 
Um, the first is from a hydrologic standpoint, understanding you know, what the conditions are within the basin and how the dam is going to impact conditions both upstream and downstream. Uh, what those impacts will be on economic growth and productivity. Uh, you know, how different operating regimes might impact energy production potential in Ethiopia, how it might impact food production downstream in Sudan and Egypt. These can be very, very difficult things to figure out. And assessing the environmental impacts can be extremely challenging. So there's a lot of science and evidence that needs to go into all of that. That's the technical side. On the other side, uh, there's, you know, and this is a process that's now been going on for not just 10 years when the dam was announced, but maybe for 20 years as the countries throughout the basin have been working very hard to find a cooperative way of managing uh, the water resources of the Nile. But the second is it more of a political challenge, which is, you know, who actually has the right to what water, when, and for what purpose? Uh, and, and resolving those issues can be incredibly difficult. And you can imagine in this case, where Ethiopia desperately needs the power and where water is such an important strategic resource for Egypt that these two things are coming to a head and are, are very challenging to solve. And now the African Union is attempting to mediate the dispute in, in ways that the U.S. was unable to. And uh, what, what can be done? What kind of guarantees could Ethiopia provide that would address the concerns of whether it's Sudan or Egypt or any other country? Um, my guess is that's only going to come from years of operational behavior. Uh, I think the downstream countries are going to have to see how Ethiopia manages its, its dam, what kind of consultations Ethiopia has with the downstream countries when we run into long-term droughts or floods, and, and we're going to want to manage these things conjunctively, what type of effort Ethiopia goes, uh, goes through to help ensure that the downstream countries can plan for and react to changes in operational procedures upstream. You know, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see how all that plays out before confidence is built downstream. It's very difficult to reach any sort of agreement uh, that will address every eventuality. And you can certainly put gauges in, you can observe from space to get a sense as to whether or not the right amounts of water are being impounded or the right amounts of water are being passed. But uh, how you respond to long-term challenges like drought and other conditions, uh, that's something that's going to have to be a consultative process. And to be frank, I'm not sure the parties will ever feel secure until they've worked through it a couple times. So what you're describing is turn on the faucets and then learn through trial and error and adjust as we go. Uh, yes, but. Um, I, you know, I think that's <laughs> what has to happen uh, because you need to develop that experience. I think to really understand how the dam works and how the basin's gonna work and be able to adapt to all the different systems. I mean, there's a lot of pieces of infrastructure, uh, you know, that, that starting from the, uh, the dam in Ethiopia, you've got pieces of infrastructure in Sudan, you've got the high Aswan Dam in Egypt. So you've got all these other pieces of infrastructure that also need to be operated. And they're all gonna be trying to respond to this new flow regime. And how do I optimize the management of that piece of infrastructure given the new world reality. And it's going to be a very iterative process. And that's going to be critically important. The reason why you need some sort of an agreement is that you still want to create some sort of confidence among the parties that their long-term uh, interests won't be compromised, that the things that they hold dearest, uh, will st they'll still be assured that there's a de minimis level of protection that they will receive. And I think that's what Egypt and Sudan are after right now. And how serious can this conflict become beyond technical? Uh, President Sisi, I think just in the last week, said that Egypt would not resort to a military response, which is a bit of a startling statement in the first place that that might even be on the table. Well, you know, I, I think there's, you know, four ways that a country can respond in a situation like this. They can respond uh, diplomatically. In other words, reach out to their partners and have a conversation of, and to try to reach an agreement. They can respond politically, reach out to other parties who might be able to apply pressure, either economically or political pressure, uh, on the governments to change their views. They can respond kinetically, in other words, go to a, a, an outright conflict, or they can respond covertly, engage in all sorts of nefarious activities to undermine another government and things like that. Um, you know, I think the reality is uh, Egypt is right. Uh, a kinetic conflict is not in their best interest in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I'm not sure any conflict uh, whether direct or indirect would be in their best interest. Uh, part of the reason why we wanted the, uh, we, and I mean we in the global community, wanted to see this dam become a success uh, is, is A, we certainly wanted to bring power to the Ethiopian people. 
B, we certainly wanted to store water so that the downstream countries in a time of drought would have access to more water resources. Incredible benefits that we really wanted to realize. But C, we also wanted to create a platform where these countries were regularly engaging with each other to solve complicated problems, because that process in and of itself has tremendous benefits to peace and security across the Horn of Africa. Yeah, this is one of the poorest, most conflict-prone regions of the world. If we can get them working together on how they manage this basin in a thoughtful, cooperative way, you can really set a new tone for how you deal with security issues across the Horn. Aaron, beyond this specific dam and beyond the, the epic and legendary Nile River, what can we learn from this situation that applies to potential disputes brewing over water across the planet? Oh, uh, actually quite a bit. I mean, some of these things I think we already knew, but it, look, if you're, if you're the downstream country, you don't have much negotiating leverage, right? Um, and, and that's probably lesson number one. Um, number two, this question of international law, that if, if you're a downstream country, there's some protections that you can turn to that will help um, uh, make your case in situations like that or defend your interests in cases like that. And I'm not sure we're seeing that there, right? You know, Egypt has gone to the UN Security Council. They've reached out uh, and, and cited international law a number of times. There really is no binding international law that countries like Egypt, Ethiopia, and many others are parties to that would really say, this is how you do it. And, and, and these are the processes that, that you would work through. Uh, so I think this, this suggests a very rough time for downstream countries in places in the world where they've got an upstream country that's ready, ready to develop. That's a real challenge. A final thought is, tell us about the Water Institute. What is the UNC Water Institute doing? What is the agenda and, and what projects are you working on? Oh, well, thank you very much for asking. Um, so, the, you know, our goal at the Water Institute is really to change the way the world thinks about water and the way they work on water. Our goal is to really to bring evidence to how we address you know, global water challenges. And this covers everything from drinking water and sanitation issues to water resources management to transboundary water and conflict issues. Uh, right now, of course, we're all talking about COVID, uh, the impact that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 might have on drinking water supplies. Do we see it in wastewater? How do we uh, deal with it in the treatment of water? How do we improve access to hand hygiene so that people can wash their hands and they have the water they need to be able to wash their hands and prevent the spread and control the spread of infectious diseases? spending a lot of time on that lately, working a lot on how we improve environmental health conditions. How do we ensure that people, when they walk into a, a hospital or a healthcare facility anywhere in the world, that they actually have running water, that they actually have soap, that they actually have a way of handling human waste uh, so that they're not spreading disease and they're able to treat disease and offer patients and expectant mothers a safe platform to be able to receive health services. Well, it's certainly uh, easy to take it for granted when the water is flowing, but it suddenly becomes a, an existential concern when it's not. So, Aaron, thank you for joining us today and for all the uh, valuable information you've been able to share. Well, my pleasure so much. Thanks for having me. Look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Take Aaron care. Salzberg is the man, the director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again for another episode in the near future. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.